All right, we're going to talk now about sorting algorithms. And this has got, I, I can't imagine this taking um, fewer than two videos to cover. But it's just a general overview, okay? So we're going to do a little definition. Um, basically, you're going to sort a collection. That might be an array, it might be a vector, it might be a list. If you're in Python, it could be a tuple. Um, anything that is a collection of items, also known as a sequence, you can sort, okay? Um, and of course, to sort means you're putting it in order from smallest to largest, or from lowest to highest, uh, or in alphabetical order, okay? Where the smallest is gonna be on the left and the largest is gonna be on the right. The only way we can sort is if it's something that we can compare and say something is less than, equal to, or greater than something else. If you can't do that, then we can't really sort it, okay? For example, um, you could sort days of the week if you put it in a certain order, right? But you might not be able to sort days and uh, fruit or something, unless you're sorting it alphabetical by the spelling of it, right? Anyway. So anything numerical or alphabetical, we can sort. If you can think of something, other way of sorting, let me know. Okay. So what would be the point of sorting in the first way? Um, rather than do that, let's do the counterexamples. Can you imagine having your textbook be randomly ordered? Uh, on the first page, you might have the last section of Unit 8. And um, you might have a history book that starts with the Cold War and then goes to the Spanish-American War and then hits the revolutionary period, and then after which goes into the, you know, um, you know, the uh, post 9-11 or something, right? It wouldn't make sense. We'd have to put it in order. It, it's gonna, you want it in order so that you can proceed through it, you know, logically. Can you imagine a phone book inserting names randomly? You're trying to find someone and you gotta get their number and you have no idea where their, their name's gonna be, right? Um, and it could be page one, it could be page, you know, 5,000, right? We don't know. Okay, humans, by our nature, we love order. We, we will impose order on our world, okay? If it's not there, we'll make sense out of it. We'll put things in order, okay? You should imagine you ever play a card game. It, usually the first thing I do when I dealt all my cards and I can look at it is I'm going to sort them because then it allows me to play better, right? If I don't know that I have um, a, a straight and if I don't, you know, in order to have a, a straight or a straight flush, I'm going to want to have things in order so I can compare and see, oh, wait a minute. You know, I've got a six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, that kind of a thing. So I can now, you know, sort it, right? So if we have a database and we're going to search for an item in the database, we could do a linear search where it doesn't require a sort. Or we could do a binary search, which is way more efficient. So we're going to want to sort it. So sorting is important. Okay, so let me just give you some of the types of sorts that are out there. These are not all of them. There is the bubble sort. There is the insertion sort, the selection sort. These three are kind of a linear type sorting mechanism. Um, we also have a merge sort, quick sort, radix sort, standard sort. There's a bunch of different ones, okay? So let's go and talk about the two main categories. We have the linear sorts that basically goes through an array one element at a time and performs swaps as it's going through. Okay. We call that a sequential type sort. Examples of a linear or sequential sort would be the bubble sort, the insertion sort, the selection sort. Okay. So each of those are linear. In other words, we're going to actually iterate through an array and perform swaps while we're doing it. Typically, it actually requires you to create um, a nested iteration. So you have to loop through an array until there's no more swaps. So you actually loop through the array the array number of times, okay? Unless you make you 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 you've got it all sorted and you don't have to make any swaps. Then the other kind are the divide and conquer sort. These will break up arrays into smaller sets or subsets, and each set will be sorted independently. Okay? Examples of the divide and conquer sort would be merge, quick sort, radix sort. Okay? And again, these are just examples. These are very common ones. Okay? 
So one of the things we got to look at is the cost of a sort. Okay, um, what is it going to require us to do this particular sort? And so there are kind of two main factors we look at. The first factor is how many comparisons you're going to make. The second one might be how many times values are switched. Okay, so we look at comparisons. We look at uh, times of switches, um, and then each factor could cost us time. That would be to the comparisons, for example, the number of swaps. Okay, It's going to take more time if we have to make more swaps. Also, it's going to cost us in memory allocation. So anytime you create a, an additional array, then that is you're going to have to put into memory, and that's going to cost. Uh, anytime you make a swap, you need a placeholder to make the swap. You need to create a temporary variable. That gets added into the stack at some point. Um, and then, in particular, uh, remember the divide and conquer, many of them use a recursive algorithm. They don't always, but many of them do. And whenever you do recursion, you're adding activation records on the call stack. So that's going to cost us memory. Okay? And if we have really large data sets, that can be sort of costly. Right? So these are all factors that you look at when you're measuring sorts. So we're going to look at these, and in a way, if anything, I'm going to be putting these in order of worst to best as far as efficiency goes. So unfortunately, I'm probably doing this in a bad order. I should probably introduce you with the absolute best one and then go to uh, uh, the, the least one or sandwich the, the, the least efficient one right in the dead center where you're likely to forget it. Um, so please try not to hold on too tightly to the bubble sort. It is not the most efficient. Now, if you're working with the very small arrays, that's okay. In fact, actually, the bubble sort can be efficient in smaller arrays. And so it's not necessarily like an evil sort that you must never do. Okay. Well, let's go over what is it anyway. First of all, it's going to use multiple passes. It's a linear sort. Okay. It's going to work from left to right. So when we, when we iterate through our array, we start on the first item on the left, and we work to the right. Every time we go through the array, we go through the array, and we, every time we find a larger number, we move it closer and closer to the right. In one pass, one iteration through the entire array, at the end, there will only be one officially sorted item, and that's the largest. And at the first pass, the largest item will be at the far right, or the left, wait, did I say left? Yeah, far right, far right, excuse me. At the end of the, at, at the, end of the sort, okay? Um, and so the, worst, uh, the best case scenario is it's already sorted, and it's going to work through, and it's not going to have to make any swaps, and everything will already be in place. The worst case scenario is everything's out of place, and we have to loop through this array for the entire number of, ar of ar items in that array. Okay? So every time we're passing, we look at the first value, we compare it to the next value, um, for example, let's say we have 11, 3, 5, and 32. Okay. Um, if the item to the right of 11 is smaller, we make a swap. So 11 now gets moved to the next position. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to keep swapping until no more swaps are performed. So in this first iteration, um, this 11 will make a swap with 5, but it will not make a swap with 32. And at that point, it's going to be 3, 5, 11, 32. The next time it loops through it, guess what? It's not going to make a swap. And if we don't have to make a swap, once we've gone through it that last time, we're done. Okay? And in this case, that was kind of a, an almost best case scenario. Okay? Um, but the only thing guaranteed is at the very end of one pass, we'll know for sure that the largest value will be at the end of the collection. Okay? Now, I'm going to run it through a visualization here. Here we go. Why is it flowing through? See how the... Notice, keep moving the largest to the right as we go. That's called the bubble? Yep. And then the last time where everything's green. All right, let's take a look at the algorithm for the bubble sort. It's actually one of the easiest ones to write. We create a, a for loop. And I'm going to pose this as if it's a counter-controlled for loop in pseudocode. 
So we set the index position to zero, and we're going to loop until we get to the length of the array minus one, because we always start counting with zero. You'll see a lot of pseudocode out there that sets i to one, and it goes to n. But I don't like to do that, because that's not typically how we index. We start at zero. Okay, So that's what I'm going to do. And then we're going to go set another for loop. You will use j from 0 to n minus 1 again. So it's a nested loop. Inside, if a at position j is greater than a at the position to its right, j plus 1, okay. so if it's a larger number, we want to swap it. So in order to swap it, we create a temporary variable. You've got to do this first. okay? Create your temporary variable. We create temp, and that becomes what a at index position j is. Then we set a at index position j to the value of a at j plus 1. Oops, I missed the number 1 in there. Sorry. Let's get it with the num right there. There it is, number 1. Sorry. Um, and then a at position j plus 1, we set that to temp. And that basically, in essence, swaps those two values. And then we just keep going through that for loop inside. Okay, And we end the if. Okay, um, and then we end the for loop. Okay, if we make no swaps, we're done with that for loop, and we just go through the whole thing. Okay, like so. So that's just the general algorithm for the bubble sort. Okay, let's talk about selection sort. Selection sort is also a linear sort. It works the opposite of the bubble, but the algorithm is a little different. Okay. By the way, um, you probably may find other algorithms for doing these sorts because there's. A lot of times there's more than one way to do it. So this is not the end all be all for it. Um, so it works the opposite. Instead of putting the largest item to the right, we're moving the smallest item. And every we go through a loop, find the smallest item, and put it at the beginning of our unsorted array. Okay. So let's come over and let's take a look at it visualized. And then we'll talk about the algorithm after that. And there you have it. Okay, let's talk about the algorithm of selection sort. Also, we do another for loop. And we're going to create a small sub. And we're going to set it to i. Small sub is like small sub position. Um, we set it to i, so it starts at 0. It's a variable. And then we're going to run a for loop again through our item. Okay, So with our small sub, we basically start where index position 0, we're taking our array. And if our array at index position j is less than the small sub, okay. remember, um, small sub actually is going to be uh, 0, the first item. And notice how we do a for, I, for j equals i plus 1 to n minus 1. So we're actually going to loop through everything but that first position. You see how that's different? And then we're going to check it if uh, a, in other words, this a index position j, and that's supposed to be brackets, not parentheses, sorry. Um, if that's smaller, we swap that. And the way to swap it is we just set it to small sub. So small sub now becomes j. So if we keep looping, we only change small sub if that item is smaller than the previous small sub. That's how it works. Okay? When we're done with our for, love, for loop, we've got our small sub. So now we make our swap. So we take the temporary a index position i. And then we now set a index position i to the small sub. And then we set the small sub equal to temp. And then that's how we move it. So we make a swap now. So we're pu putting the small sub into the beginning of our list, and then we're done. So we keep doing that until there's no more, no more loops.